What is going on, everybody? Tonight's terrifying tales, we are going to outer space. Better yet, this is a horrifying video all about aliens and UFOs and government conspiracies. A shout out to one of the authors, The Eagle Strikes. He also has a YouTube channel, Black Volumes. The link will be in the description box below. Now sit back, relax, dim those lights, and let's get spooky. You know the conspiracy. The moon landing was faked. It was a Hollywood studio set. It wasn't even filmed live. All true. You might feel vindicated knowing that the televised broadcast was an elaborate ruse. However, I wouldn't smugly don that tinfoil hat. The 1969 broadcast was fabricated because the real moon landing uncovered unworldly horrors. In 1992, as a fresh-faced NASA employee, I experienced this organization's classified initiation process. I was privy to the knowledge that the iconic moon broadcast had been a hoax. I felt pity for Aldrin, Armstrong, and Collins. If the technology had been ready, they could have walked on the moon, I sighed. Nobody deserves that mission, Dr. Penny Bradshaw muttered. I ignored the scientist as she wasn't the most socially adept person. Do you know about the first tape? She continued. I sighed, realizing the conversation could not be avoided. Huh? I asked, attempting to mask my annoyance. The first tape, Penny repeated. I don't know what you... We went to the moon, Penny said. The Apollo Lunar Module went to space, but it was the Aldo Module which landed. It was the Scouting Module. Enclair and Smithson were the first men on the moon, and the Apollo Module would have landed too, but... A second module? I scuffed, but deciding to entertain the old woman's wild story. And why wouldn't these astronauts receive the credit for landing first? Snapping back into reality, Bradshaw flushed. Oh, I... I shouldn't have talked about this. Forget what I said. Dr. Rowland told me we never landed on the moon, I said. Why would he lie? Why would he spin an even taller tale? He could have allowed NASA employees to continue believing what the rest of the world believes. We distract you from the truth. Some things aren't worth knowing. Before the moon landing, we had no idea what we were going to find, Dr. Bradshaw explained. But there were murmurings about the unsettling frequencies. They received signals which had driven several scientists to abandon the project entirely. Many of the higher-ups didn't want us to send a manned mission to the moon, but the Russians were stubborn about pressing onwards. We had to beat them. I don't understand, Dr. Bradshaw. I said, not believing a word of her tale. People saw things, Daniel. Things they couldn't explain. The radio signals drove them insane. One man took his life, but they didn't talk about that. And they didn't talk about what really happened on the moon. They didn't tell us any of this, I said. And if it were true, they would tell us. She sighed. You have no idea about the things they hide from you. Aldo 11 was a black operation off the books. It ran alongside the Apollo 11 mission. It was intended to prove to NASA that Armstrong's manned mission to the moon would be safe. Right, I sighed. Ignoring me, Penny Bradshaw continued. We had the contingency to utilize a pre-recorded tape from the studio. And when Aldo 11 failed, that's exactly what we did. What are you saying? I asked. 
We went to the moon, but the real tape was never televised? Penny Bradshaw nodded. There were two teams. Armstrong's team and the team who saw a horror beyond your wildest imagination. I was nothing more than a newly graduated boy, and I knew that hazing was common in many workplaces. But in the case of Penny Bradshaw, I knew she didn't have a vicious side. I thought she had simply lost the plot. She was an elderly, near-senile scientist who ended up retiring less than a year later. It was a well-known fact that Bradshaw was suffering from the early stages of dementia. But she had secured a steady position at NASA. She had status. I should have respected that. I should have respected her. But I didn't think about what she said until the Clementine mission in 1994. It was a disastrous expedition, intended to observe the moon and 1220 Geographos, a near-Earth asteroid. But it was the case with many lunar missions. It ended with a devastating spacecraft malfunction. Yet with this particular failure, all I could think about was what Penny Bradshaw said. A horror beyond your wildest imagination. If that were so, why would NASA return to the moon? Perhaps I had wisened in my two years at the organization. Whatever the case, I found myself entertaining the idea she had planted in my head. Hey, Frank, I said. Frank Perez was known as the man who could get things done. Things that weren't strictly within the bounds of the company policies. Things which often weren't legal beyond company policy. The IT specialist didn't even name a price for the favors. If you were a close friend, he would just do about anything off the record. He loathed NASA, though he still works for them to this day. Daniel, he said, throwing his arms wide. This is a late shift for you. I was about to head home. I embraced my friend and cut directly to the point. I've been thinking about the moon landing. Well, that's an interesting opener. He smirked, twirling in his creaking desk chair. I've been thinking about the truth. Ah, the greatest Hollywood story never told, he chuckled. But that's not the truth, is it? I replied. We did go to the moon, and just didn't show what really happened. The squeaking of Frank's desk chair ceased, and he twisted the face me. Did someone tell you something, Daniel? He asked. I nodded. Frank sighed. And what makes you think I'd know anything about that? I'm just a lowly... Nice try. You always know everything, Frank. I interjected, grinning. He smiled. I do like that reputation. Of course, that doesn't mean I should know the things I know. Just as you shouldn't. Is it true? I gasped. They double bluffed us? Frank nodded. Why would they tell us that they faked the moon landing? I asked. Why not continue with the normal narrative? Why are they so determined to bury the truth of the astronauts who really walked on the moon first? They fed us a phony secret to keep our eyes off the real one, Frank answered. It's the sort of maneuver I would expect from the conniving worms on the board, of course. But I fixed their computers, Danny and their security is abysmal. I've seen their secrets. They may know a lot about physics, but I know more about hardware that runs this place. What did you see, Frank? I asked. The man shiftily cast his gaze from left to right, ensuring that everyone in the office had gone home for the night. Then he beckoned me closer. The real 1969 tape, he said. Though I knew nothing at that moment, the whispery tone of his voice iced my body. What was on it? I asked. Frank's eyes grew distant. Death. The computer expert patted a desk chair beside him, and I sat down. I have the file, you know. I shouldn't, but I do. And I'll show you. He said, starting the type. But the contents of that tape change you. 
I shivered, but my lips moved with their own volition. Show me, I said. Frank nodded, having already entered Prism into the Explorer's search bar. One final thing. He paused, hovering the cursor over a file entitled 011 Tape. I sighed. Come on, Frank, it's okay, I know what... You don't know anything, and you'll know even less after seeing this. It will corrupt your dreams for nights to come. He interrupted. After I saw the footage, I had visions, Daniel. Awful visions. I made it through the ordeal, but I don't know what happened to me. The same thing that is reported to happen to anyone who watches it. I rolled my eyes. Come on, Frank. You watch too many films. You may be a man of science, Daniel, but in ten minutes, you won't be. There are various classified documents concerning the tape. These reports detail the things that Enclair's team found, and even 30 years later, we still don't understand it. Nightmares, hallucinations, I'm ready, Frank. This is the opportunity to witness a pivotal point in human history, something few people had ever seen, I said. I won't let this opportunity pass. But, Frank started. You survived it, I interrupted. I'll be fine. I'm willing to take the risk, Frank. Curiosity got the best of me. I don't believe that a tape causes hallucinations or feverish dreams, but I certainly hope it gives answers. He sighed. Some questions don't have answers, Daniel. Nevertheless, Frankie Perez clicked on the file, and the tape began to play in a small video. The video contained grainy, blurred footage of a metallic ladder leading towards a rocky, cavernous surface. This is Enclair, a man with a sturdy French accent announced. Status report on the Apollo 11 module. Enclair, this is Mission Control. Apollo 11 module nears arrival, awaiting your verdict. A static voice responded. Roger, Enclair replied. Taking my first step now, and the weather's looking fine. You are the first man on the moon, Commander Lewis Enclair. Congratulations. The voice responded. Thank you, Control. Enclair responded. Smithson is joining me now. Second man on the moon. Smithson joyously laughed. The pair floated aimlessly for a few minutes, reveling in the truth that they were the first two people on the moon. Though nobody outside of NASA would ever know. I could only imagine the elation they must have felt. Readings do not match those of unmanned missions, Enclair said. No radio interference. Coast is clear. Negative. Picking up readings near the Surveyor 1 site, Commander, Smithson said, visibly hopping in the distance. Copy, Smithson. Do you copy? Mission Control? Enclair asked. Copy, Enclair, the static voice said. Analyzing the transmission now. Unidentified radio signal confirmed. It matches the Surveyor 1 data. Referring with primary mission controller, waiting for the go-ahead to continue. Continuing exploration, mission control, Enclair announced. The warped footage depicted the two-man crew bounding slowly across an ever-darkening lunar surface. Their craft had landed towards the dark side of the moon. Enclair steered the camera towards Earth for a brief moment, and a white block was visible in the distance, the official Apollo 11 module. Commander, are we clear to proceed? Smithson said. The second-in-command pointed an eager-gloved finger towards a lightless opening in the face of a mountainous ridge. On Clarence Smithson, this is Mission Control. Await instruction from Controller. We have not cleared you to keep... Negative. On Claire interrupted. I won't go home without seeing what's in there, sir. Smithson, we're heading into the cove. On Claire, the Mission Controller has... The static voice started. Return ship. 
Aldo 11 crew. Another voice intermittently growled. That in order. The second man sounded much sterner than the first, but the transmission was so choppy that he was barely intelligible. Enclair took advantage of that situation. Did not copy your last two messages, Mission Control, Enclair said, hopping ever forwards. Entering the crater. Commander Enclair and Smithson roared into the blackened mouth of the untowered cavern. Dim lights fitted to their suits guided the way, but the camera's footage seemed to deteriorate with every passing second. Did you hear that? Frank asked me. I had been so immersed in the recording that I hardly noticed my friend and I were sitting in the dark, empty office. I had truly believed myself to be on the moon with Enclair and Smithson. But I heard it. The crackling? I asked. Frank nodded. That interference from the radio signal. What is this signal that they keep mentioning? I asked. Frank's face turned pale, but he didn't respond. He simply nodded his head at the footage of the astronauts floating through the narrow, lightless, underground tunnel. Commander Enclair, do you see that? Smithson shouted. The commander gently sprang towards his friend, and the camera revealed a domed room. Oddly smooth walls enclosed the tiny space. It all looked manufactured somehow, unnatural. What is that? Enclair whispered as the two astronauts swam towards the center of the room. I realized that the light was no longer coming from the astronauts. I distinguished a translucent, glossy object in the heart of the room, a triangular prism that emitted a throbbing glow. The recording was so damaged that it was painstakingly difficult to discern the visuals or the audio, and yet, something about that object was crystal clear. It was immeasurably vibrant, distinct from its surroundings. This is the source of the signal, Smithson said. I told you we were right to land here. Excellent work, Smithson, Enclair said. Mission Control, do you copy? Aldo 11 crew, do you receive this transmission? Return to your module now, the static voice repeated. Roger, we lost you for a minute there, Enclair lied. It's beautiful, isn't it, Smithson? We'll go down in history for discovering this. Could it be evidence of alien life? God, who knows? Future scholars will decide. Smithson didn't respond. Smithson? Enclair asked. The unresponsive astronaut hovered before the prism, transfixed by the inexplicable light it cast from its invisible innards. Smithson, we're going to return to the module. Do you copy? Enclair asked. They might still allow the Apollo 11 mission. We've proven that there is no danger here. I didn't used to understand. Smithson whispered, seemingly oblivious to his commander's presence. I do now. Enclair glided closer, filming the bright object. The audio interference increased in severity. Smithson, are you okay? Enclair asked. Aldo 11 crew, return to your lunar module. Mission Control repeated. And then something happened which, to this day, I have not been able to rationalize. The prism's front face reflected something I recognized. A man standing beside Commander Enclair. My dead father. I exclaimed in horror and the tape froze. What is this? I asked, panting heavily. But Frank, like Smithson, didn't hear out of his own head. I'm... I'm sorry, Amelia. I'm so sorry. I was staring at something beyond any scientific explanation. In a 1969 tape on the moon, I saw my father. That tall, terrifying man from my childhood. A malignant man. A man who somehow eyed me from the prism's surface. An object filmed 30 years on an ancient, cursed film. I had long suppressed the memory of what my father did to me. The merciless beatings. The night on which he tried to kill my mother. 
my tenth birthday. But his bulky black eyes bore into my soul. That painful prism provided clarity that I never wanted, never needed. It reminded me of what happened that night, how I saved my mother. It revealed the knife in my hand, the blood staining the serrated edge after I sliced his throat. I had to do it, I convinced myself, eyes swelling with fearful tears. The prism tape unfroze. Smith, son? Aunt Claire cried. Aunt Claire's camera was no longer in his hands. It floated in the cavern. As it slowly rotated, the angle captured Smithson repeatedly plummeting his commander's body against the rocky wall. The dearranged astronaut fumbled for the clasp beneath Aunt Claire's helmet. No! Aunt Claire screamed, trying to resist the stronger man. The helmet released. Aunt Claire seized in agony for a dozen seconds before losing cautiousness and Smithson stiffly watched his friend motionlessly float before him. It sounded as if he might have been crying. Was he still there? Did he feel remorse? It was impossible to ascertain what happened. As for Aunt Claire's unsheltered head, the footage was, thankfully, too distorted to replay the detailed horror of his oxygen starvation. The tape ended. The prism vanished, but on the glassy surface of Frank's monitor, barely discernible against the desktop background, the reflection of my father remained. Terrified, I tried to move. I tried to face Frank. The spectral father grew in the screen's reflection, and his face smoothed before caving inwards, transforming him into an eyeless entity. Following the clarity, there was distortion. The prism had shifted its focus, and we were slaves in its perspective. Using all my might, I managed to snap my neck free of its paralysis, and I turned to see wide eyes on my friend's face. It was only supposed to be a dream, he whispered breathlessly. The fluorescent light bursted above our heads, and we plunged into darkness. However, unexpectedly regaining control of our limbs, Frank and I fell from our chairs. What did you see? Frank panted. My father, I whispered. And he's... Disappointed, a voice hissed. I twisted my head to see my father, a man's frame who scraped the ceiling tiles. He was scarcely illuminated by the moonlight, but I could feel those eyeless sockets surveying me. Run! I yelled. We stumbled to our feet, and the nightmarish depiction of my father swung hopeful fingers in my direction. He caught the nape of my neck, and I cried in agony as I felt flesh peel away, burned beneath decaying nails. But I didn't stop to lick my wounds. I pushed Frank forwards, and we navigated the labyrinth of cubicles. It, it never seemed real to me. Frank started as we breathlessly ran towards the exit. Keep moving, I screamed. I didn't dare look back, but I heard furnishings and office equipment crumble beneath the boundless limbs of my malformed father. The prism preyed on my darkest thoughts. It depicted Dad the way I had always seen him as a child. Frank burst through the exit, and the light from the hallway spilled into the office. We stumbled out of the blackness, and I spun to slam the door on the abomination pursuing us. Then, with bated breath, we waited for the creature to tear through the flimsy door, before undoubtedly tearing through us. But nothing came. The sound of footsteps tapered away. I pictured my father silently waiting on the other side of the door, baiting me, must as he always had done during my childhood. But there was only silence. It must have been about ten minutes later when one of us finally dared the move. The IT specialist shakily crept towards the office door. Don't, I whispered. Let's just leave. Frank shook his head. We have to be sure, Daniel. The man threw the door open, and he flicked on the main lights. 
They illuminated an empty office space. My father was gone. She's not here, Frank whispered, wiping tears from his face. Who? I asked. I saw her when I first watched the tape. Amelia. My Amelia. She was my wife, Frank explained. I saw her in my dreams, nightmarish hallucinations, but never anything real. Nothing that came for me. This time, she was angry. Frank, I... I began. It was my fault, Daniel. Frank interrupted. I took my eyes off of the road and... I didn't see the truck coming. I didn't. It should have been me who died. That's what she kept saying to me as we ran. It should have been you. And she was right. She was telling the truth. That wasn't her, Frank. I said. I know. The man whispered. And it wasn't your father, either. What is it? I trembled. The prism, Frank replied. Everybody sees something different. A person's darkest moment, I said. Frank nodded. But it's never been real before, Daniel. It's never been anything like that. Look at your neck. That's no hallucination. I gingerly touched the bloody gashes behind my head wincing as the adrenaline wore off and the pain finally came to my forefront of my senses. Why did Smithson kill on Claire? I groaned. I don't know why he did it. I don't want to imagine what he saw. Frank shuddered. Afterwards, he took his life. Immediately following the horrors which unfolded in that cavern, NASA aborted the mission. Apollo 11's lunar module returned home and the pre-recorded tape was broadcasted on live TV. What about the prism? I asked. NASA left it up there, right? I hope so, Frank whispered. I've worked at NASA for almost 30 years, long enough that I got to see the ISS get put in orbit. It's generally regarded as one of the biggest things we've ever done, and I agree. The amount of scientific data, discovery, disaster observation, it's just priceless. We would be living in the worst world without that hunk of metal orbiting our planet. It's a strange feeling to see everyone talking about taking it out of the sky. On one hand, the thing is getting pretty old. It was built for 15 years of operation but it's been functional for 21 now. On the other hand, I'm, well, a little sentimental. Maybe all the talk of dismantling it is making me feel old. Pretext first. There are many things I'm not going to tell you about myself for obvious reasons, but I could tell you my experience with NASA. They're very open about things, inside the agency as well as outside. A lot of people like to think NASA is holding some serious secrets, but that's just not true. Sometimes you can't walk 20 feet without hearing a young excited scientist nerding out about some new discovery or theory to their colleagues. Management puts it how it is because it's the line of work everyone needs to know, and if anyone miscalculates it could mean disaster. All big scientific discoveries are put on paper within 24 hours and released to the public. You all get the picture. Point is, in 30 years of working here, I've never encountered much dishonesty unless a politician walked in the door. I know everyone really well, and we all get along just fine. Recent events have changed everything. The excited chatter has mostly stopped. The U.S. government has people in suits crawling all over the place. And the higher-ups obviously haven't gotten sleep since it was announced that the ISS was to be decommissioned. Despite all this, we're to continue like it's business as usual. But every now and then, one of us will get called up to an interview with the suits. Sometimes they'll be gone for a few minutes. Sometimes they'll be gone for hours. But when they returned to work, we would ask what was going on. Every time, we would get the same answer. The suits would bring them into a room with the table, ask them some confusing, uncontextual questions, and let them go. It's not hard for us to connect the dots. Something happened in regards to the ISS. Some of us are closed off from upper management now, 
and those who could talk to them have that look in their eye. The look begging you not to talk to them, but they can't tell you not to. Everyone else is as confused as I am, and work has slowed to a crawl. Occasionally, we'll get an exciting announcement that renews our wondrous, exploratory, childish minds. But for the most part, it's become dreary. A few days in, I got pulled into a room with the suits. There were a lot of formalities to get through, like my name, age, place of birth, etc. But then the questions started. Their demeanor changed on a dime as soon as the first word was spoken, and given what that question was, I would have laughed if I hadn't been dragged into a room with government agents. What is your opinion on the color green? I didn't know how to respond at first, but eventually I said, I guess it's an okay color. I mean, it's not my favorite, but it's nice. I remember feeling like I was back in elementary school with the entire class talking about what color was the best. It was awkward, and due to the situation, quite jarring. Below, I've got the rest of the questions and the responses that I remember. Agent. Do you have any aspirations besides working at NASA? Me. I've got a bucket list. Skydiving, seeing the world, that kind of thing. Agent. Do you believe you will come to complete that bucket list? Me. Well, yeah. Gotta retire at some point, right? Agent. Good. Do you wish upon falling stars? Me. What? No, that's ridiculous. Agent. If you did, is there anything you'd wish for? Me. Well, I don't know. Biological immortality? Agent. Do you hang posters in your room? Me. Not since I was a kid, no. Agent. What is one thing you consider objectively good? Me. Kittens. I said it in jest, of course. Sometimes I try and break tension with a little comedy, and it was out of my mouth before I even knew what I was saying. Even so, I at least expected a slight smile before I was scolded, but the only thing the agent did was straighten his tie and repeat the question with a somehow even more serious look. Me. Fine, fine. Make sure those around you live their best lives, I suppose. Agent. You suppose? Me. No, I figure of, not that doesn't apply. Listen, this is awkward. I stick by what I said. Final answer. Can we move on? It was at this point I realized that the agent had straightened his tie. It had changed from a formal black to a dark green. Either the agent had just pulled a magic trick with the smoothness of someone from Vegas, or I just hadn't realized it had been green the entire time. The brain has a tendency to find patterns and lie to you, so in that moment I brushed it off, but the other two agents in the room still had black ties on. Agent. Yes, we can. Tell me, what is sound? Me. Well, airwaves. Specifically, vibrations. Right now, when you speak, you are sending air particles crashing into each other, sending them to me, and my ears are picking them up. Agent. Do you mind if we take your temperature? Me. No. I had mine taken at the door, but I guess you can here too. It was true. The agents had been taking everyone's temperature at the door these days. I didn't know why they needed to do it a second time but I wasn't about to argue. One of them walked over and used an unbranded digital temperature gun. After they had finished, the agent nodded to the others, and I was escorted back to my floor and told to have a pleasant day. I was bombarded with questions from my colleagues, as was everyone else who had gotten interviewed, but I didn't really have much of anything new to say. After that day, I started doing a bit of investigating, I'd only been interviewed for a few minutes, so I started asking for specifics from those who had been taken for far longer. As far as the questions themselves, I had gotten no luck. They were still ridiculous. Things like, have you tasted dog water? Or, have you ever gone hiking? 
but there were some consistencies too. When I brought up the green tide, they said they saw the same, but brushed it off for the same reasons I did. The temperature check. It happens at the end of every interview to everyone regardless of time. But for those who got interviewed for over an hour, there was another through line. All of them were asked what the International Space Station was to them. At this point, I knew for absolute certain that something was being kept from us regarding the ISS. No more rumors, no more speculation, no more conspiracy theories. The agents were interested in our space station too. I had to get to the bottom of this. So I contacted the guys in charge of doing the math for weight on the next supply run to the ISS. Did I mention that they're still sending things up there? Because they are. Apparently we were in a tough spot. Usually you know exactly what is going into space. You have to for literally hundreds of safety reasons. But the agents have been interfering since they appeared. They'd say that something new had been added to the list. Tell them to weigh and then inform them that they needed to update their math to include the mystery item. It was so against code that they tried to take it up to management several times. But every time, management shot them down. I was told that one guy was considering quitting in protest due to how unsafe just randomly adding unknown things to a spacecraft was. But the next day, someone else showed up in his position. The kid was friendly, excited, and under the impression the position had been left vacant for a while. He had no idea he had just replaced someone. I tried to get in the contact with the person who was fired, but no dice. The phone number must have been bad, but I didn't know him well enough to get in contact any other way. Deciding given the situation, it was a bad idea for me to do so anyways. Those agents kept giving me stares when I started asking for his number. But I had been working here for 30 years and I had my contacts. Decided to hit up some of the old ISS crew members. I was buddy-buddy with a few of them, even taking them out for drinks on occasion. I had been joking with a few of them not even a few months ago, and while our current predicament probably had nothing to do with them, I had to be certain. I went through every single number, but they all went to voicemail. I know people sometimes change their numbers, but all of them? I branched out beyond the US. Wasn't too close to these guys, but I'd still shared a beer with a few of them. Still, nothing. Not a peep. Nothing but the robotic voice telling me to leave a message after the tone. At this point, I was anxious. Not a single ISS astronaut was answering the phone. I knew where a few of them lived and started compiling the addresses. But while searching them up, I came across their pages. They all had Google profiles, of course, but now all of them had death dates. I sat there shocked as I saw my coworkers, friends, and associates, all described as having died while in the woods, in gas explosions, car accidents, even a serial killer had gotten one of them. I read into that one, by the way. Someone had broken into their home, family of four. I'll spare you the details, but by the time the police arrived, it was too late for any of them. Allegedly. The killer was high on several narcotics and died of an overdose while being arrested. Several murders have been linked to him after the fact. I was shocked and heartbroken. No one had ever told me. And the way the guy went out was devastating. But when I looked at the date of the murder, I had to check my calendar. But there it was. I had taken the astronaut, his family, and several co-workers out to a movie not three days after the article he had died. It was to celebrate his full recovery after staying on the ISS so long. Things didn't line up. And while most of the death dates made sense, some others didn't correlate with my calendar either. After I compiled all the addresses, I took a looking at the properties. All of them were closed down due to one thing or another. Gas leak had burned one down, one of them had left a stove on, a local forest fire had destroyed another, every single house was gone. At this point I had to see it all from my own eyes. After work the next day, 
I went on a half-hour drive to one of the closer residences. It had been a month or so since the property was owned by one of my closer buddies, so it wouldn't have been strange to see me around the area. Sure enough, the house was a smoldering ruin. Didn't even look like it had happened that long ago, maybe a day at most. There was even a fire truck still outside with firefighters sorting through it all. I was going to pull up and ask what had happened, but then I spotted the black van across the way. More government agents. I didn't want to be seen there, so I just drove by like anyone else would and didn't make eye contact. Could have been my paranoia, but I swore I could feel their gaze burning into the back of my skull. Now I knew. Every single ISS crewmate was gone under mysterious circumstances. I think it's the government itself, but I don't understand why. I like to believe they aren't actually dead, just in a holding cell somewhere until this all blows over, but I just don't know. To make matters worse, I was approached at work the next day. Agents, of course. They didn't bring up any specifics, just saying the same thing they had been saying from day one. Don't interfere with their business and everything will be just fine. Then they left, and the day continued as per usual. Scared me half to death, though. My mind was running through the possibility that they were going to make me disappear too, and it took every ounce of mental strength I had not to look like I was caught. Not even sure I did look normal that day, to be honest. I had lost a lot of sleep and was living off a of coffee. As of now, rumors about weapons being smuggled onto the ISS are circulating. No one is allowed to go to the upper floors now, and people are starting to get replaced faster and faster. One of my colleagues who had been doing some investigating of his own said that he looked at the ISS through his telescope and swears to God that it was spinning out of control and half covered in something black. Took a look myself, but I couldn't find the station at all. It's definitely not on its projected orbital path. No one outside the agency is talking about this. For all the public knows, NASA plans to decommission the ISS in 2031 and land its remains at Point Nemo, which I will add as the furthest point from human civilization on the planet. They even denied letting museums keep the pieces of it, opting to just get rid of the darn thing. I'm too afraid to go press on about it. I don't want to be replaced because I'm pretty sure everyone who does isn't just going back home unemployed. And those agents? They've asserted even more control. I pretty much directly report to them now. And they're the only ones who go upstairs. No one has seen anyone from upper management in weeks. To make matters worse, I haven't even seen the agents express a hint of remorse, or any emotion really. It's just the stone cold stare 24-7. I'm starting to think they're robots. I'm also starting to think I'm going crazy. Like I've been cooped up in a cage for far too long with the eyes on me at every waking moment. Does anyone have any idea what's going on? I need to get out of this before I end up in a cell, or worse. I think they know I'm looking into it. I don't know what I'm going to do. My friends are gone, along with half my colleagues. I just feel helpless. I somehow survived. I'll make a part two. It's here. It's been a long time now, somewhere along the lines of eight months since I posted this here. I had been advised, rightfully so, not to talk about what had transpired until 2031. But right now I feel like a bird in a cage left in the basement of a recently deceased owner. There's a good chance I won't even live until 2031. So here goes. Shortly after I made my initial post, I was on high alert for any indication that the agents knew it was me who leaked the info online. I figured they'd publicly act like it didn't exist and that was fine, but I had no idea if they would be able to trace everything back to me. I had planned a fake passport and an emergency exit with one of my last remaining connections at work. 
I had planned a live feed camera to record the event if it ever came to pass. I had planned to do my best not to go quietly as everyone around me was. Instead, I woke up without control of my own body. I didn't even notice at first. I got up and did my morning routine, checked everything I wanted to check, and went to work. At first, it was the little things. Brushing for precisely two minutes. Driving with just a little more precision. My math coming just a little faster than usual. The biggest change? Usually when you're afraid of something, your body reacts. Even the most practiced actors give some indication and usually were able to at least determine the emotional reaction to a threat. That instinct was gone. An agent walked by and felt nothing. It was as if the agent was just another coworker. Thinking this was odd, I tried to move towards the bathroom to think, but I didn't. I just didn't. My muscles didn't contract or expand. I wasn't being held down or anything. Any command I sent my body simply didn't register, and suddenly my brain was separated from it, watching helplessly as I casually conversed about my work with that aforementioned last contact. My body didn't even act like I wasn't in the situation I was in. It brought up concerns about the agents, ensured my back door was still open, even hinted at the destruction of my ISS buddy's house. It was then I noticed one last detail. The tree leaves outside were absent despite it being spring, and the ties of the agents were invisible to me. I panicked, screaming out for even a door or wall to appear in my mind's eyes so I may pound on it. My perfectly imitated actions removed, even the pulsating of my heart was no longer my own. Slipping away into madness seemed easy in the moment frighteningly easy looking back on it. And that's what I did, at least until I was stabbed in the back by a needle and dragged kicking into a janitorial closet. My screams were muffled by several hands, yet more arms wrapped around me as I lashed out in blind rage. I had never been a violent person, but let me tell you, in that moment, punching someone square in the jaw of my own violation felt godly. Coming to my senses, I realized I had nailed the janitor. Two other people were restraining me. One was a kid that had been reluctantly hired. The same one I had been talking to about the load to and from the ISS. The other was an agent, but his sunglasses had been removed, and his expression was not one of complacency, but the hardest, deadliest stare I had ever received. His eyes told me everything, and I immediately stopped resisting. The story I heard afterwards shocked me to the core. The kid and the janitor were related. Grandpa and grandson, I think. Both were extremely conspiracy theorists. And when I say that, I mean straight up flat earth, aliens are real, we live in a stimulation stuff. Apparently, the janitor took up his post over a decade ago to try and figure out if anything fishy was going on. And once this whole fiasco kicked off, his grandson squeezed his way into working here. Don't know how he pulled it off, but I suspect that conspiracy and sanity only bolstered his intellect like a bloodhound catching wind of a scent. Being the guy who did all the calculations on what went to the ISS, he had access to all of it. They were transporting an assortment of things. A few weapons, strange color-based test cards but most notably a few containers of green liquid. That same green liquid was the stuff injected into my back to bring me back, but there was a limited supply. The agent, who was now typically going by Smith, picked up the threads of the story. Smith had been assigned here due to an arising emergency on the ISS. The situation started with one of the astronauts starting to act strange asking several questions of the crew that would have already been known like, Why are we here? Who are you? What is that? In reference to Earth. It had become extremely obvious that the crewmate wasn't acting like themselves at all. But being highly trained professionals, the astronauts kept calm and contacted base. 
What ensued was a string of experiments and a line of questions that aimed to both figure out what had possessed the man and bring their friend back. It didn't work. Soon after the funding went through to get the astronauts everything they needed, contact with the ISS was lost. It flew off its trajectory and started to fly around the night sky with no regard for momentum or the thrust and maneuvering needed to make the twists and turns it was making. Supernatural reports started to pop up everywhere. It was pieced together that this thing was inhabiting people's bodies and controlling them for an unknown purpose. It's secret, a national state of emergency was declared, and agents like Smith were dispatched everywhere, armed with little data the astronauts had sent back to identify a possession. An obliviousness to the color green and the lack of understanding about, well, how anything worked. It was deemed that an alien entity of some kind was to blame, and the work to contain it had been extensive and ripe with turmoil. It soon became evident to the agents that with every passing possession, the entity became more and more able to cover its tracks and hide. And eventually, the interview became grounds for the entity to study the agents right back. Soon, Smith found himself playing his part perfectly while stuck in his body like I was. It was pain that brought him back. Pain inflicted on him by the conspiracy crew. Apparently, the sensation was quite the surprise to the entity and it recoiled in a matter of speaking when any of its hosts were injured. Someone had figured this out before even the people had, as the green liquid was starting to burn through my veins. At first, a small jab is enough to release you, it was explained to me, but the entity adapts to the pain in return. The liquid would gradually increase the amount my blood boiled to keep my actions my own, but I was on a time limit. At some point, the pain would be too much, or the entity would catch up. Just looking at Smith's clenched hands and strained brow, I could tell he was struggling. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't the guy who went up in the shuttle with nerves of steel. I did math. Luckily, everyone else did. The top floors were completely occupied by the entity's puppets now, and while Smith had been controlled, he saw his colleagues constructing something. Given that everyone didn't have long left as it was, and information was limited, they had resolved to get up there and figure out what was going on once and for all. They roped me in because not only did I have higher clearance, but I have been working there for a very long time and might have some insights to give as they went. That wasn't going to protect us, though. Smith had learned the hard way that the entity knew when it had lost control and also knew how to send agents after him. The big green screen sheet the conspiracy crew had commandeered, however, would. Yes, that was the plan. Cloak ourselves in a green sheet and make our way up like a band of fake YouTube vloggers. I realize now in hindsight that there is an element of comedy in that. But all I could feel in that moment was the steady slow progression as we bobbed and weaved between people and objects like we had an invisible cloak. Worst part was that, unlike an invisibility cloak, you can't see through a green screen. We had to do everything by ear and what we could see by our feet. Smith and I managed to navigate us farther than anyone would ever been able to possible, landing ourselves onto the entrance to the top floor. The green liquid was starting to make me feel like my internal organs were being scolded, making every step stomach churning. I think what got me to that point was knowing that Smith was in twice as much pain, but had yet to break. Though having only met briefly, I'd come to admire his grit, but then disaster struck. I had to give credit where credit is due to the conspiracy duo. It's very likely none of us would have ever broken free of this thing had they not decided to indulge in their crazy fantasies in their heads. Well, a crazy fantasy that I now lived. But freaking out after dropping your tinfoil hat due to fear of possession right next to an agent was a stupid move. We covered the janitor's mouth swiftly, and for a moment everyone on the floor stopped moving. 
you could have heard a pin drop. But what broke the silence was a flurry of violence. Smith threw off the green screen and slapped the nearby agent in the face to at least momentarily free him. The agent was consumed by the same rage I had been, and while he lashed out at Smith, re-engaged his earpiece and announced to any free agents that the entity had control of the building and that pain could break their spell. Everything erupted into chaos. I would learn later that the revelation had caused excessive discord on the lower floors as the entity drew guns on the free agents. One moment you're sharing a cup of coffee with your pal, the next that pal shoves a gun in your face. We didn't get that treatment. Everyone on this floor was controlled, and therefore we were subject to a hail of gunfire. It only took one bullet from Smith. The first controlled agent to be hit lashed out against the one closest to him, then the agent next, until a cascade of freshly shot suits lined the ground. It all happened so quickly, I barely had time to register that I had been shot myself. The janitor was lying in a pool of blood covering the kid, and Smith was clutching his chest where ten holes had been opened. The pain from the green liquid had reached a point where getting shot was only a little bit worse, and now that hiding was no longer life or death, we all started to groan and scream. The mere thought that the entity was attempting to claw its way back in was enough for me to take action. I told the kid to get out of there and began to stumble my way forward, Smith just behind me. No, I don't know how he kept moving. It'll forever remain a mystery to me. At this point I was seeing the building through tears, but I saw it well enough. Parts of the walls and electrical wiring had been removed and reallocated into the center of the floor where more entity-controlled people were. They were my bosses, their bosses, and probably their bosses after that. Along with them were many of my friends and colleagues that had gone missing. All of them were hunched over desks, scribbling nonsense, or sorting out materials from crates onto the floor. I recognized the crates as being designed for the ISS, now repurposed. The most striking thing, however, was in the center of all of it. It was like some kind of sickly and slimy black net pulled into a ball shape, wiggling and writhing as if floating in the air. Inside the net portion was a series of black shapes and nothing else. What this thing was started to click to me, but what happened next only cemented my thought. Smith stomped forward with the rage of a dying man. With nothing to lose, he leveled his weapon at the entity and screamed out his command for it to release all it had possessed. While there was no answer, he opened fire, or at least he tried. After two clicks of his handgun, only to realize he didn't have a clip in the gun in the first place, or a clip in his belt for that matter, the handgun suddenly vanished from his hand, and then Smith started to follow suit. I say started because it's important to point out how he went. It was like layers of him were being deleted all at once. First his skin, his muscle, his bones, and finally his nervous system, all stolen from reality. Smith didn't stop crying until the last vestige of his body had been taken, his voice ringing from every direction at once before fading away. First, of course, was the paralyzing realization that I knew the general concept of what this entity was now. The second was the paralyzing fear of that concept. When we drew a stick figure on a piece of paper, we don't think much of it. It doesn't think much of us either. As if we were to be alive, it couldn't comprehend our existence. It knows up, down, left and right, but forwards and backwards? The stick figure couldn't leap into the third dimension without assistance from a human. It had been long then theorized that there was a fourth dimension. Not time, of course. Don't get confused. I'm talking about a fourth spatial dimension. I've studied the fourth dimension and what it could possibly look like as a hobby, along with other scientifically related things I'd come across on my path to NASA. 
How I had seen Smith vanish lined up almost one-to-one -one what passing into the fourth dimension could look like. A theory made manifest. I, standing in that room in the unbelievable pain, was that stick figure. A stick figure that could not comprehend the dimensions around me, or the entity that now stared down at my page free to erase me at will. I had nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. In that moment I felt I only had one option. I ran at the small portion of itself that the entity had made known at the center of the room, and then I touched it. It's, it's extremely hard to visualize for you what happened next. I was both falling and ascending through a plane of fractual contradiction. Light flashed in unknown angles and sound reverberated through my head. In my mind I knew I had just launched myself into the fourth dimension in a fit of fear. And I had a lot of trouble coming to terms with not only that, but everything around me. I saw things. Black amalgamations of concept itself. I could only sense the eyes now falling upon me as the structure of reality itself closed in around my very being. Then a second presence. I found myself the subject of communication, like something had stuck a spike into my head and fed me a crude binary code. Then I found myself in Australia. The sun was rising above the ocean next to the beach I had appeared on. The word-like feelings of a fourth dimensional entity still processing in my head. Roughly it was an apology, and a scolding of a younger entity. My eyes were forced to gently glance at the anthill a few meters away. Then I looked up, now in control of my eyes, and saw a blazing comet falling from the sky. The ISS had fallen out of orbit and was burning up in atmosphere. Officially, NASA is still business as usual until 2031, when the ISS officially gets decommissioned. But I'll never come to terms with the reality I now find myself in. We were ants played by a malicious child from beyond our understanding. Nothing but toys and a fleeting moment of boredom for it. A terrifying rational emergency costing hundreds of lives for us. And the worst part, it could happen again at any moment. The fourth dimension exists, and we are powerless to stop it.